doing that. Anyway, um, local time here is 11.35 and uh, still on the way to Cincinnati, Ohio for the morning, tomorrow morning delivery. For the meantime, I uh, would like to share with you my favorite pastor, uh, John MacArthur. I have learned so much from him and uh, it gives us a little bit of a perspective of God's will as far as politics goes. So, there you go. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. governments and leaders prove to be inconsistent and faltering? Why does society seem to be in a constant flux of change, upheaval, and disgruntlement? Why are there so many leaders and politicians, yet none of them seem to ever agree? These are questions I'm sure many of you have asked, and ones that I've asked myself. This inconsistency and instability in leadership is a symptom of sin, a sickness we're all affected by. We choose to be wise in our own eyes, abandoning the moral law of God written on our hearts and in Scripture. We choose the foolishness of man, which is stable as a wave upon the ocean. That rebellion infects everything, and God gives those people and that nation over to itself. But what does it look like to be a God-honoring ruler? And what are the consequences with such an intentional choice? In part two of Who is God's Candidate, John MacArthur begins to answer each of these questions through the immovable source of truth, Scripture. Does the Bible require anything of rulers, or is it just a theocratic issue? If you're a ruler in the kingdom of Israel, God has requirements, but beyond that, he doesn't care what rulers are like. Uh, is it just that God cares uh, what pastors are like and elders in the church and leaders in the church and really doesn't care about other leaders? The truth of the matter is God has requirements for all rulers, all those who have authority over people. The separation of God and true religion from government is a disaster. It is a disaster because now you have led people to believe that the law written in their heart is not binding and you now confuse the conscience which is the personal restraint and you define behavior that is acceptable in ways that are inconsistent with God you literally free up people to live in open violation to the law of God which is a kind of inevitable spiritual if not physical suicide government should never separate itself from God from the true God and the true law of the true God all godlessness all your religion all immorality leads to the destruction of a society Acts 14 says God has allowed all the nations to go their own way and when they go their own way they run through the cycle of disaster described in Romans 1 they reject God they plunge into immorality and then homosexuality and then a reprobate mind and then judgment it will lose control and plunge that culture into chaos and self-destruction. Driving a massive wedge between society and God is the path to national self-destruction. I want to give you ten characteristics that the Bible requires of a ruler. Ten characteristics the Bible requires. I want to give them to you, and uh, I'm going to give them to you in a list. One is worship, two is righteousness, three is justice, Four is wisdom, 
Five is honesty. Six is morality. Seven is humility. Eight is teachability. Nine is security. And ten is courage. Those are specific attributes that God requires of rulers. Turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why is the world in such constant chaos? And the peoples devising a vain thing, useless things. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, meaning, of course, the Son, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. The rulers of the world want to free themselves from their accountability to God and the God's anointed. But he who sits in the heavens, God, laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, speaking of the Son of God. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. Now blessed are all who take refuge in him. Any ruler, any king, any person in authority who shakes his fist in the face of the true God, who rejects God and rejects God's law in any way, will find himself under the terrifying judgment of God. The executioner here is the Son of God himself, who will crush all such rulers who refuse to worship the true God and take himself the nations as his own inheritance. O oh, you kings, show discernment. The first priority for all rulers is to worship the true God, and the true God as revealed by his anointed one, the Son of God. Psalm 72, 11 says it this way, let all kings bow down before him, all nations serve him. Psalm 138, verses 4 and 5. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth, and they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. That's not a prophecy. That is a hope in the heart of David for what could happen in the world if Israel was faithful. David is saying if Israel is faithful, and Israel is the example of what a blessed nation is like, and the world looks and sees that blessing, then all the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord. That was a hope for what Israel could be as a witness to the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, who says, speaking concerning God, after he had learned a, a really terrifying lesson being turned as it were into an animal he said i bless the most high and praise and honor him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion his kingdom endures from generation to generation all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him what have you done at that time my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven for all his works are true and his ways just and he's able to humble those who walk in pride. That's what every leader on the planet ought to be saying. Every leader ought to give the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. That ought to be in the lips of the President of the United States, the Governor of every state, the Mayor of every city, and every judge who sits on any bench. 
Psalm 47 is a call to a universal worship. Oh, clap your hands, all nations. Oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob, whom he loves. God has ascended with a shout. The Lord, with the sound of a trumpet, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. Every shield represented some national entity. Every shield, every flag, if you will, they all belong to God. He is highly exalted. And that means worshiping the true God, and that means worshiping the true God in spirit and in truth. God requires that of every ruler. Secondly, God requires righteousness of every ruler righteousness that he adhere to the law of God listen to the last words of David 2nd Samuel 23 the last words of David David the son of Jesse declares the man who was raised on high declares the king he says the anointed of the God of Jacob the sweet psalmist of Israel speaking of himself as Israel's king the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the Rock of Israel spoke to me. Listen to this. He who rules over men must be righteous. He must rule in the fear of God. There is worship in righteousness. That is a great verse. Literally, he who rules over men must be righteous and rule in the fear of God. And when that happens, he is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth through sunshine after rain. What that means is you get a blessed nation. You get a blessed nation when he who rules over men rules righteously and rules in the fear of God. Proverbs 20, 28. Loyalty and truth preserve the king, and he upholds his throne by righteousness. Proverbs 25, 5. Take away the wicked before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. That's saying not only does the king need to be an advocate of righteousness, but he needs to get rid of all the wicked people around him. Take away the wicked before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Proverbs 29.2 When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Literally, the Hebrews are made to sigh. When a wicked man rules, the whole nation sighs, mourns. Isaiah 32, the prophets also spoke of what God required of rulers. Behold, a king will reign righteously, Isaiah 32, and a prince will rule justly. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. You see, this is all speaking of what happens when you have a righteous ruler. When you have a righteous ruler, the nation enjoys the full benefits of common grace. That ruler becomes like a
like a refuge from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like shade from a huge rock in a parched land. There's a third characteristic that God blesses of a ruler, and we've already seen it in some of these passages, justice. Justice. It was in several of the texts that I read. I won't go back to those, but I do want you to take a moment to look at Psalm 82. Psalm 82. It is in this psalm that God calls the world's rulers together. He calls them together to surround him. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. God assembles, as it were, in this psalm, the rulers of the world. The word rulers refer to kings, legislators, judges, presidents, whatever they are. And God says to them, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? How long will you do that? How long will you, as a justice in the Supreme Court, advocate the slaughter of babies? How long will you advocate homosexuality or any other form of immorality? How long will you judge unjustly? How long will you favor those who buy your influence, who buy your power, who buy your decisions, and show partiality to the wicked? Rather, he says, vindicate the weak and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and destitute, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. See that in the context of abortion. The weakest, the most needy, the most helpless, do you crush them? Do you slaughter them? This is not justice. This is not justice. God says of these rulers, they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. What in the world does that mean? When leaders walk in moral darkness, they literally shake the foundations of society. They literally destroy moral order established by God. They undermine the very foundations of society. Verse 6, I said, you are gods. I think with some sarcasm. You imagine yourself to be so powerful. The truth is, all of you are sons of the Most High in the sense that God created you. You may think you are gods, but you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possess all the nations. It's a frightening, frightening word from God to any ruler to be called to a tribunal, to be gathered around God himself and be asked how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? How long will you take up wicked causes? You think you're gods, you think you rule, you think you're sovereign. You're all just sons of the Most High God, and you will die like men. You will fall like any other prince. Proverbs 29.4 says, The king gives stability to the land by justice, but a man who takes bribes overthrows it. The king gives stability to the land by justice, but a man who takes bribes overthrows it. If you can be bought by any person, any interest, any collection of people, you literally overthrow your own land. Proverbs 8, 15 says, By me, speaking of wisdom, and prudence and justice, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, verse 12, I, wisdom, by me, rulers decree justice. Justice comes from knowing 
God and knowing the truth concerning God. God has defined what is just and what is right. You cannot look to a cultural definition. You cannot be a ruler and say, I'm against that. Two years later, when you test the latest poll, oh, I'm for that. You must always be faithful to the law of the one who rules. Second Chronicles 19.5 Jehoshaphat appointed judges in the land in all the fortified cities of Judah city by city. He said to the judges, Consider what you're doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. You are a judge. You are under obligation to the law of God as revealed in Scripture. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. This is the message to every judge, everyone who presides on a bench. Be very careful what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. Verse 9, he charged them, saying, Thus you shall do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and wholeheartedly. Whenever any dispute comes to you from your brother and live in the cities, between blood and blood, between law and commandment, statutes and ordinances, you shall warn them so that they may not be guilty before the Lord, and wrath may not come on you and your brethren. Thus you shall do, and you will not be guilty. You're a judge. When anybody comes to you with a case, you tell them the law of God and tell them that they must adhere to the law of God, and if you tell them any differently than that, you're going to be under God's judgment. Any judge who advocates any unbiblical behavior is under the judgment of God. Verse 11 ends, Act resolutely, and the Lord be with thee up. So number four is wisdom. Number four is wisdom. We've already intersected with that. But go back for a minute to uh, Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. And I don't want to leave this one out even though we've referred to it. Proverbs 8, verse 12. I, wisdom. I, wisdom. Wisdom is personified here. Wisdom is if it's speaking. Really the wisdom of God, of course. I dwell with prudence. I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom. I am understanding, power is mine. By me, that is by wisdom, kings reign, and rulers decree justice. By me, that is wisdom, princes rule, and nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek me will find me, and riches and honor are with me, endure wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield better than choicest silver. I, wisdom, walk in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of justice, to endow those who love me with wealth, that I may fill their treasures. God doesn't want you poor, but the path to treasure is the path of wisdom. The path of wisdom. Again, going back to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, God comes to Solomon in verse 7 and says, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon said to God, You've dealt with my father David with great loving kindness. 2 Chronicles 1 8. You've made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, your promise to my father David is fulfilled, for you've made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge, that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can rule this great people of yours? God said to Solomon, because you had this in mind, didn't ask for riches, wealth, or honor, or the life of those who hate you, nor have you even asked for long life, but you have asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you, and I will
will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings who are before you has possessed, nor those who will come after you. He asked for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. And by wisdom, he acquired wealth. Anyone who rules is required to be characterized by divine knowledge and divine wisdom. Listen to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel in chapter 2 is speaking to God. And it says, He blessed the God of heaven, verse 19. And here's what Daniel said. Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to Him. It is He who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is He who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with Him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. And what a ruler Daniel became, didn't he? He rose to be the leader in the Babylonian Empire because he was given the wisdom of God. Wisdom comes only from God. Only from God. You cannot rule wisely if you reject the true God and the true revelation of the wisdom of the true God. Proverbs 25. These also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, transcribed. It is the glory of God to conceal the matter. God doesn't reveal everything to us. But the glory of kings is to search out a matter. In other words, a ruler should be defined as one who diligently searches out the right solution to any matter as the heavens for height and the earth for depth. So the heart of kings is unsearchable. In other words, this is a call to exhaustive search on the part of a ruler to understand what God desires. Take away the dross from the silver, and there comes out a vessel for the smith. To take away the wicked before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. There's that verse again. When a king is committed to the search for wisdom, and that search is for the wisdom of God. He will remove the wicked so that he is clear in his pathway to the truth of the true God. Mark this. If a ruler is a liar, all his advisors are liars. They have to be. If a ruler is wicked, all his advisors are wicked. If a ruler is a liar, then he is an agent of Satan, who is the father of lies. Next week on Grace to You. When leaders walk in moral darkness, they literally shake the foundations of society. They literally destroy moral order established by God. They undermine the very foundations of society. Any judge who advocates any unbiblical behavior is under the judgment of God.